Rachel Spawn, thank you for coming on, on to the Raising Game podcast. Um, thank you for letting me into your amazing home for, for this little, this, this conversation. Um, we met really randomly. We did. We? It, was, it was after the, the test match cricket mm-hmm. and, and uh, we, I was in a bar and someone just goes, oh, you have to come and meet Rachel. Like, you have to come and see her. And um, and we met and then we set this up. So yeah. thanks, thanks for doing it. And I never go it. out. I'm probably in a bar once every two years, Lewis. So, so I got you on the perfect timing. That, that was that's fate, that <laughs> isn't it? That's um, that's perfect. So for those of you who don't know um, who you are, you played WNBL for oh how many years? Nineteen years. Nineteen years, and then went to the went to America. Yeah, so I played for Detroit Shock. So the WNBA was only formed when I was gosh nearly what was it ninety eight. So I was thirty when yeah. the WNBA was formed. So I had three seasons with Detroit Shock. They were a new franchise. They don't actually exist anymore. They became Tulsa Shock now that D- Dallas Wings, right. where Aaron Phillips was playing. Oh wow, okay. Mm. So, and there was no connection there with Erin being local, you being local, or no, just yeah, just so happened that she ended up playing. Yeah, there. she ended up being there. So, oh, wow. yeah. so let's rewind, rewind all the way. Let's go all the way back. <laughs> what? I'm just going to start with why basketball. Okay. Why? Why did you get into basketball yeah. in the so, first place? So I'm a country girl. So country Victoria, a town of only 300 people. So sport was our entertainment. There wasn't much else to do wow. but play sport. So thankfully, mum and dad gave me a lot of natural sort of talent athletically. So I loved athletics days, swimming. Um, there wasn't a lot of sports available to play. Like we didn't have squash courts. There was no hockey, um, no softball. Um, basketball wasn't introduced into Maraville until the year I was born in wow. 1968. So mum started playing this amazing new game after I was born. And there was no junior grades. So I didn't start basketball till I was nine, but it was because of mum. So I was playing B grade with adults when I was nine. I used to get five minutes at the end of the game if I was lucky. And then by age of 12, I'd had a massive growth spurt. So then I played A grade and I played five years with mum and we won five premierships, which was pretty cool. Wow. Um, but it was hard to gauge how, you know, my talent level of basketball, because you're in such a small community, yeah. I was tall. Yep. So I was able to dominate. And um, it wasn't until I moved to the city that I realised, oh, I've got a bit of work to do. <laughs> really? So as soon as you came out the country into the city, it hit you hard? Mm, and, yes, yes. And so what did Absolutely. you do when you got into the city? Like, where did you start? Where um, did you... So I was... I didn't play any state basketball when I was living at home because uh, with Country Victoria, we're the second most remote town from Melbourne. And we actually played our sport in South Australia. So those that right. know the areas, Pinaroo, Lamaroo. And I was... I played an association game um, for our district in Bordertown and a West Adelaide scout saw me play. And she went back to Adelaide and said, there's this tall, skinny girl called Rachel, you must recruit her. So the, the coaches drove the two and a half hours um, to recruit me. I was in year 11 at the time. They wanted me to move to Adelaide in year 12 and play basketball. And I was like, there is no way I'm leaving home <laughs> to yeah. do my most important year at school. Um, so I didn't move here until I was nearly 18. Mm-hmm. And I was so behind because we didn't play. I don't know if you know a lot about basketball, but we didn't have any offences. We didn't play man-to-man. We just played zone. You just cut the key. Uh, I didn't know any of real basketball terms. Um, so my first year here was really hard. I had, suddenly had to learn all the offences. I'd get frustrated. Um, yeah, so I'm very, very thankful that I was at uni because then the coaches could spend extra time with me during out of lessons um, mm-hmm. during the day. So if I'd had a full time job, it would have been hard to get that extra coaching. And I tell you, I needed it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So when you when you're as you're moving through this, was there a, kind of a moment where you were like, "Well, oh, this is going to be." It's yeah, going to be a career. Probably, I was, and do you know, I, one of my things that I say, Lewis, is that you have to make the most of your opportunities. And my opportunity was back then there was three WNBL teams, whereas now there's only one, Adelaide Lightning. Right. So there was West Adelaide, North Adelaide, and Olunga. And there's no way a rookie kid from the country was going to get um, a, a game with Adelaide Lightning when there's only one team. But because there was three, I was playing in the WNBL in my first year. So very lucky. And my first ever time on a plane was my first WNBL game to Tasmania. No way. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Um, But I I often say I thank my 17-year-old self for sticking it out because it was my first year here was very hard. I was homesick, even though I was only two and a half hours away from mum and dad. 
very homesick, um, was just struggling with the training and, and grasping all the concepts of basketball as I knew it. It was very physical. Yeah. At home, you didn't really touch each other. It was a non-contact sport, but suddenly the physicality, I had to get used to that. And I had to toughen up yeah. pretty quickly. So do you think it's, do you think it's harder now then? For if 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 yeah. you were doing what you did then now, mm-hmm. yeah, you there's no be way I could have come down to the city at age 18 with the skill set I had and probably succeed now. The, the, it's very different now because they because of the talent identification programs now they get the kids earlier. Yeah, so they're getting the skill levels up earlier. Yeah, um, so, so it gets strengthened in the cities a little bit quicker yeah, it or does. a lot quicker. Absolutely. Just because of the pool of coaches that you've got available to you. But when I see, because my niece Sienna lives in Waikaree and my sister's travelling the two hours, um, two times a week for her to train and play. And she's got great school level. She's 12. So she's, you know, and Hannah's, my sister's been coaching her in Waikaree and then she's got wonderful coaches here. So I already see the advancements for country kids from compared to when I came through. Yeah, and, mm. and I've read that your brother played at AFL. He did. So, so he went footy, you went... Yeah, so he played basketball as well. Right. Um, but, yeah, it was never going to be something that he pursued. And so Kieran um, will admit that he wasn't a superstar at home, uh, but he got... So West Adelaide is in our zone mm-hmm. and he just worked hard. He had an amazing work ethic, had his knockers, said you won't make it. Mm. And um, so he was actually drafted in the first ever draft, AFL draft in 1986. Whoa. But back then you could, um, you didn't have to go if you didn't want to. So he wanted to get a couple more years under his belt at Westies. So he didn't go to Essendon until the end of 88. And uh, played in the losing grand final to Collingwood, which he's never watched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts too much. Um, so he had a lot of highlights. Um, low lights, though, he's just had a knee replacement. Oh. So, you know, the so it was, took its toll on him Absolutely. physically. He, he probably needed a knee replacement when he was 28, had bone on bone. And oh. he, uh, yeah, unfortunately, he sort of got the worst end of the stick. I've been very lucky. I'm, I'm in no pain. Um, yeah. You know, in my career, as he's been in a lot of pain, and yeah, so it was pretty wonderful having Kieran playing AFL. We actually made the Australian team and AFL the same year in 1989, mm-hmm. so that was pretty special for our family. Wow, what? what um, so I grew up with a, a younger brother who was sporting as well. He ended up playing cricket. Um, he ne- he never ended up playing professionally like I did, but. I, I always attribute the fact that I had my sporting success was the fact that I had a sporting sibling. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm always fascinated by eventually athletes that have that are um, only children. Mm. I think that's a, usually a, a different path on the sports yeah. they go into tend to be individual. But yeah. um, it, I always find it interesting. Usually siblings end up with teen games. I don't know what it is, yeah, but it's, it's right. the rivalry between mm. people. Um, but do you attribute a lot of your success to the fact that you had a sibling that oh was either? Oh my god, yeah, because we were so competitive. Yeah, like we'd end up fighting if you know we, we uh, both of us wanted to win so badly with whatever we did. It was cards, <laughs> yeah. board games, and then you know I'd kick the footy with him a lot. We play um, you know cricket, continuous cricket a lot. Uh, ride our bikes. So we, we were just very competitive, and we always had sporting equipment in our hands Mm. we had a cupboard out in the veranda that was just full of everything baseball bats tennis rackets everything so we tried a lot of different sports um but yeah as i said we were a little bit limited so i was basketball and tennis in summer i loved tennis as well and i was netball and table tennis in winter yeah and and you said your mum was playing basketball so mum was an exceptional basketballer um and dad was a great footballer he played for north adelaide in the 70s here he actually got recruited to um Richmond when he was 16 yeah he got too homesick and went back to the farm yeah so dad potentially could have had an AFL career wow. um, but he had he came here in amazing years in the early 70s with North and um, won a few premierships down here so where do you uh, it's interesting where I sit with this because uh, the nature versus nurture hmm. sort of outlook on sporting um, aspect I get it all the time people come up to me and go oh well your parents must have been pretty sporty <laughs> Par- no. <laughs> parents didn't play sport like literally <laughs> mum ran a few marathons uh dad he, he he would play football when he was younger but to no level yeah. and yeah never really played cricket i think mm. i played once with him and it was in a like charity game <laughs> but i'm i'm fast i personally believe my personal belief is that we have uh 
it's, it's our environment we put ourselves mm. in. I, I look at my brother was playing sport uh, and I was just literally competing with him. I was in a sporting environment trying to compete with him. Uh, I, I don't know what you be- believe on it, whether you feel that there is some element of the your parents passing something on to you. It's in- it'd be interesting to get your take on it and how, yeah. how you feel that nature versus nurture mm. balances. I think I think for, for us, we had both um, because mum and dad had wonderful work ethic, both of them. So they sort of definitely passed that on to us. And I love that they passed on to us to respect everyone, mm. you know, officials, your teammates, your opponents, everyone involved in sport. Um, so they were very good role models for us. And I was, dad was a coach um, as well as a player up home. And I was, he was very conscientious. And I remember typing up notes for him that he would read out to his players. So he was probably a little bit ahead of his, his time in what he, he would find inspirational quotes. This is back in the 70s. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the little country town saying this to his players. And they had a lot of success. They won a lot of premierships. So I was very lucky too in that I had a lot of success at an early age because some people can go through their entire life not winning a grand final no matter what level and in in whatever sport so I think that spurs you on too having success early it's like oh this feels good yeah yeah I I agree I think I know when I was first growing up it wasn't until started winning games and and playing Mm. a part in in those winning games that you're like oh this is Uh this is a bit of fun and I'm good at this I'm I'm good at this like this is something that I want to I want to do that drives quite a lot of it I just find it fascinating. I think the the whole, what you were talking about there is your parents are almost instilling sort of your personality and your drive into the sport mm. rather than actual technical. I, I think it's, if you're going through sport, those are the things that are going to hold you in better stead for longevity of your career, having the, the drive, the motivation, the, the, the respect of officials, yeah. of, of players, of teams. Mm rather than the actual te- those the technical stuff you can learn yeah but the, yeah. the those driven traits within you they're they're ingrained for, yeah. for a long time yeah. they um they hang around for quite they a while they do no i'm extremely grateful for and mum and dad were never pushy yeah. either you know they're just whatever you want to pursue um so that and i was always you know as a parent was never going to do that with my children um, obviously, I was secretly chuffed when my daughter Taya started playing basketball. <laughs> I was like, yes, um, but I didn't, you know, want to force her to do it. And it was, and we took her out of um, four summers to do little Fs mm. and a year and a season of golf, just so she wasn't doing basketball all year round. Because what I see is burnout mm. so often with girls, in particular, that sports when they're offered twelve months of the year. Do you just think it's just the pure time schedules that they got? Crazy, given it. Yep, crazy, and I. It's hard because it's it's financially driven. You know, yeah. The clubs need the people through the door and they can't afford not to have a summer season. But that's why I like AFL because it's only in winter. Yeah, you, okay. can't, you don't play it in summer. So I like that. I'm sure there'd be more longevity with kids with AFL than other sports because it's, it's something they can look forward to. I just find with basketball, it can tend to be a blur from one summer season into winter. There's just no, not enough break. So how do they manage it? How do, or how did you manage it? And then how did, if you know so how they manage I didn't it now? Have to, well, I certainly didn't have to manage it because I grew up in Moraville. We just played in summer. Yeah, <laughs> that okay. Was it. Train once a week, play once a week. That was it. Right. So I didn't burn out at all because I didn't move here till I was 18. I was able to play till I was 36 um, and never, ever fa- fell out of love of the game. Um, and as I said, here it was really being, and my husband was a wonderful instigator of it, that we pulled her out just so she could experience other things and not get burnt out. So she's finished her junior career and she's playing under 23. So we haven't lost her to the sport, which is great because the, f- the dropout rate is crazy from under 16s to under 18s. And once their junior career's stopped, then they're done. Yeah, what do mm. you think is the most, the, the most important part of that then to keep them engaged and driven within the sport? If, if we knew that question, <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, we'd be doing well because we have, I know every sport has had the, the committee meetings. Yep. How do we stop the dropout rate? Yeah. And there hasn't been a clear answer. Yeah. So it's been... Um, changes from year to year as well I yeah, think there's always something yeah. it, it could be another sport that gets um, yep. gets a higher profile for a AFLW. year AFLW yeah, yeah, yeah it could be something that just yeah. suddenly pips them to it it could yep. be um, mm. something education driven mm. it could be a technology that's driving it it does you know their life changes they might get a boyfriend they might get a job they just yeah it's time okay I've done that for so long I want to do something different 
Um, I don't want as much structure. So yeah, it's it's an it's an open ended sort of question with an unknown. No one's been able to solve that problem. Okay, so you, mm. when in your own career, when you were turning pro, uh, how how old were you when you turned pro? That's an interesting question in itself. Okay. <laughs> well, because. I had to work full time until I was twenty six. Right. So I worked. Um, I've got. A, I had a, a bachelor of education in PE and maths, but yeah. I didn't teach when I graduated. I was at a sports store at Sports Lover all through uni, and they offered me um, managerial role when I um, left uni because I didn't wasn't sure if teaching was going to work in well with playing, and they gave me time off whenever I needed it. So. The first time I considered myself to be a professional was um, in the lead up to the Atlanta Olympic Games yep. in 96. I resigned from my job and it was just heaven because I was just a yeah, professional basketballer in the lead up to Athens. But there's not enough money in women's basketball, certainly at that point, to sustain it. So I worked part time. Um, so how are you managing that? And you're, that's incredible. Like, how are you managing training? And working. You just did. And I think because you were young, yeah. <laughs> that helped. But we would have 6 a.m. trainings and then you'd train after work. That's just how it was. We didn't know any different. Did at no it, point think, I'm going to get rid of basketball? No, 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 no never, point. It was never an option for me. Um, and I know a lot of girls didn't didn't go on with it for those reasons because it was so hard. Yeah. And you, you were tired. <laughs> yeah. Very tired. But I loved the game so much didn't bother me it was just became a I don't know part of who I was and yeah I just looked forward to the game so much and I do you know what I wish I appreciated more was how fit I was because when you retire <laughs> you're not training like that and if you go and you know run around at masters or something and I'm puffed after two minutes it's like wow I was so fit yeah and how cool was that that my job was to be fit and you don't really appreciate that till you're finished and then you got to find time to do exercise. Yeah, mm. and fit it into your life now. Mm-hmm. I, th- mm. I had, um, in one of the podcasts I've done with an a ex-professional rugby player, Kieran Lowe, in, from Scotland, uh, we were speaking about finding why you exercise after you finish your sport. It's, it's really, really tough. Yeah. I, I really struggled with it. Um, I, I was kind of going to the gym, I'm going like, well, if I'm not pushing weights or I'm running to make myself a better player, like, what am I doing? Like, mm. But then you realise... I need exercise to mm-hmm. feel good. My yes. mental health, everything's Correct. got to got to um, yeah. it ke- keeps everything in, in check. Mm. So you guys, you as you've kind of officially coined yourself as, as pro at that point in your, <laughs> in your career, you went to the Atlanta Olympic Games. Mm. Uh, you then ended up going to Sydney and Athens mm. was after that. Mm. What was what was it like at the home Olympics, Sydney? In oh, that year? amazing! And I and I need to backtrack because. Me going to the Olympics, Atlanta, it took till I was 28 because we didn't qualify for Barcelona. So I was 24. I was ready for my first Olympic campaign and we went to a pre-Olympic tournament in Spain and we didn't qualify. So it was harder to qualify then. And one, at Atlanta onwards, we just had to beat New Zealand, which was easy because <laughs> <laughs> they brought in 12 women's teams at the Olympic Games instead of eight. So in 1992, coming home from not qualifying for Barcelona was the worst. It, it, I still remember us all. We lo- So we won our first five games. We lost our sixth game in double overtime to Brazil and we lost our seventh game to Czechoslovakia by three, which we needed to win. So we, my Olympic dream was done. And I'd had Olympic dream since I was eight years old when I watched Raylene Boyle, an Australian sprinter, compete at the Montreal Games in 1976. It had been my dream. So it was really hard coming home because we all felt like we had failed and it was just awful. Um, So a lot of changes were made. Do you know, my biggest regret is that my teammates that should have been Olympians in 92, those that didn't get selected after, we got a new coach, a lot of changes were made. So that I just feel for them because they should have been Olympians in the night. And I know that so many athletes go through that, um, that they miss out on Olympic Games. So you can only imagine my excitement for Atlanta. And then we won a, the Australia's first ever medal, senior level, bronze. So yeah. that was pretty amazing. Um, and then after uh, four years later for home Olympics. And it's the period between the four-year lead up to a home Olympics is magic because you get more funding because yeah. <laughs> they, they want you to do well. Teams want to come to Australia to play you because normally we're too far away and yep. you've got to go there. So teams were just putting their hand up to come here and play. And the greatest thing was that every member of my immediate family could come and aff- afford to go to a home Olympics because when you're offshore, 
oh, 15 grand all day it's yeah. going to cost you. Yeah. So that was pretty special, having all my siblings and mum and dad there. And we didn't beat USA again. <laughs> you know, so many times I've heard, heard, had to listen to the Star Spangled Banner. Um, so we won silver. And winning silver at Olympic Games is, is interesting as well because you've lost your last game. And when you come second, you know, as you would know, you don't, you don't um, celebrate that. No. But at Olympic level, you have to think, okay, we've just, we're the second best team in the world. So there's tears initially for the disappointment. By the time you go to the change rooms, put your podium, you know, clothing on, go back out to get your medal, you're not so upset. And yeah. You've got to realise that, wow, this is pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm. The, what, um, and, then, and then you went on to Athens as well. Mm. And then you, you actually, again... Silver. <laughs> USA. Yeah. And Athens for me was incredibly special because I was a mum. So I had wow. Taya in 2002. I was the oldest member in the side. So for the first time in my career for Athens, I had to really, really work hard to make the team. I wasn't sort of a guarantee to be there. So I was, it was so satisfying knowing that I did make it. I was more relaxed, I think, because I was a mum and I had a different role, coming off the bench, not playing as many minutes. Yeah. So I could actually soak up the Olympias, or the Olympiasm a little bit more because yeah. I was pretty probably uptight Atlanta and Sydney because of the pressure, but I didn't feel that so much in, um, in Athens. Yeah, mm. and when you went over to America, which period was that? Between? So that was 98 to 2001. So that was between the, uh, between uh, the time of Athens, the, the yes, Sydney. Yes, and... and um, Six of us elected to not go back to the WNBA in 2000 because it was an Olympic year. Only two of our... Why, why did you choose that? Well, it was pretty much we wanted to do as much preparation with the Australian team for the Home Olympics. Yeah. And our coach, Tom Ma, had said to us, if eight of you go, which we could have, eight of you go to the, um, compete in the WNBA, not all of you are going to make the team. So, two, and it's why, and only two went, they both made the team... But if we'd all gone, it would have been so disruptive to our preparation. Okay. So we made that decision. We're going to stay home. Was the decision for some of those to go to the NBA to to play in America against the Americans so that when you hopefully compete against them, you've got a little bit of know-how yeah, on them? Yeah, that's... Or, yeah. Well, the, I think because, um, you know, we had played the two previous seasons, a lot of us, so we sort of knew, you know, how, how to play them. Um, still didn't help us beat them, but... Yeah, I think, and the two girls that did go, um, they sort of saw it as a financial decision, sort of closer to the end of their careers, and we respected that decision. Yeah. Um, and they were an integral part of our success when they came back in. Yeah, and, and your time in your time in America, you were based in... Um, Lovely Detroit. Yeah, so it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty in, well, yeah. Uh, you hear a lot about Detroit, yeah. uh, kind of You'd, the good and the bad. You were just told like not to go to downtown Detroit where really? the crime was. So we were in a lovely area. Auburn Hills was where the palace was, the basketball stadium. Um, it, it was just nice being a real professional athlete and you were only there for four months. It was summer get to play in all the NBA stadiums. I played at Madison Square Gardens, all that history and amazing crowds. Because the first couple of years, I think they were averaging about 14,000 every game, which for women back then was incredible. So to be part of that um, was, was amazing. So I, I loved it. It was great. How, and how have you, did you see the progression of, of women's basketball sort of throughout your career more? Yeah. M was there ever a like, tipping point for finance? Was there a... Uh, a tipping point for popularity, like some mm. 14,000 going to a game. Mm. Um, I mean, I guess at the time, NBA has always been strong for the yeah, men, yeah. but uh, the women's game is, in, in most sports as well, is rising incredibly. Yeah. Um, how, how was it in basketball? Interesting thing with the WNBA though, is the crowds aren't as good as when we first started, yeah. which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, the, po uh, you know, yeah, the popularity of NBA is, God, it just doesn't wane, does it? No. It's amazing. So, and it's interesting with the WBA because you could not negotiate your contract. You just told what you got. So when I was drafted number 14 in 1998, so I went on to a salary of 37,500 US. And when Lauren Jackson was drafted number one in, um, in 2000, she went on to 90,000. And when Andrew Bogut was drafted number one for the NBA, he was like six million. <laughs> so, insane, the, so the disparity is there because the NBA is a lot older. WNBA was very young, 
but it's also to do with TV rights, um, merchandise sales. It, it's all to do with that. But I've just learnt um, only the other day that uh, through a bargaining agreement that the WNBA players are finally going to get a, a pay rise. Because oh. I couldn't believe it that rookies that come in now are only on 40000 20 years later, it's only S- gone still. up. Still? Yep. Wow. And you still can't negotiate. And this, that's still driven by TV rights. It's still driven yeah, by... Yeah. And it, for the WNBA to survive, they couldn't play their pay, players much more. They put a lot into the marketing, which they need to. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty much survival, though, too, not being able to play the players more. Yeah. And and now in the w, uh, WNBL here uh, in, in Australia, mm. has that had a similar sort of it has way is the nba is is more popular gonna have more eyes on it yeah but it, i've basketball here in australia is very yeah. popular yes it's and, and, it, popular. and it's great to see because we went through the biggest boom in the 90s okay. like to get to a 36ers game you had to book three months in advance we played before it was just wonderful days and then we saw a real sort of decline and i reckon they are coming back um yeah and for the girls at the moment um because of Pretty much the WNBA, and now we have a players' association. They get super in their contracts. I never ever got that. Wow. This maternity leave, and again, that wasn't. I got that in the WNBA because when I signed for two years, I got pregnant with Taya, and I got maternity leave in my second year of my contract, which was great. Yeah. So they were always looking after their athletes better. But finally, it's here in Australia. So when you do negotiate your contract, yeah, there's super, there's maternity leave, all all in there. How was that um, juggling both pregnancy and yeah, Sport. it was it was hard. Luckily, I had um, wonderful support network because the pregnancy itself was fine, and I kept training um, up until I Taya came four weeks early, so I was in the gym right up until I had her. Wow! And then once you have the baby, obviously that's where your pregame routine goes out the door. Yep. Um, you need babysitters because when you're training, um, I breastfed Taya for the first twelve months, so she had to come on the road with me. And thankfully, my coach at the time, Jan Stelling, was uh, very supportive of that. And I would room with Jan so that the baby didn't wake up, Tay didn't wake up my teammates during the night. So, yeah, it was, um, it was an amazing time. But, yeah, there were, there were days where I was just so tired. Yeah. <laughs> but you just had to get past that. And, yeah, but there's, you know, there's been a few more players now that have babies and continue to play. So, it's great. Do you think the support's there now? Or yeah. it's, it needs to get better? Yeah, I th- it probably needs to get a little bit better. But, um, yeah, at least there is maternity leave in place and, um, yeah, more support as far as... Well, you still sort of... If you did take your baby on the road, um, tipping, you'd need to organise someone at the other end. You know, you'd have to do all that. Um, yeah, so... But it's defi- definitely better and you support it overall a bit better. Yeah, so you said you played up to the age of 36 and what sort of was the finishing point for you? Um, a lot of athletes finish on their own accord, but yeah. some finish through injury, some finish through... I was lucky on my own accord. Yeah. So um, it was 2004. I think I could have played probably one or two more seasons in the WNBL physically. Mentally, I was done. And I wanted to have another baby. Yeah. So I thought, I'm going to finish on the high of, you know, silver medal, Athens, pretty amazing... Um, you know, I walk away from the game, still on top of the game. So yeah, I, and it was funny because in the in when I was in my twenties, I didn't. I think I thought you'd have to just push me screaming and kicking out of the game. I didn't think I'd ever want to stop. Yeah. But thankfully, I did, and I pretty much went cold turkey. I've only played. I've been retired for sixteen years, and I've only played in three Masters, three weeks in that time. No way. I just stopped. Just <laughs> did just stopped. Yeah, completely. just stopped. Um. But I, it's not that I haven't been in stadiums, obviously, with my daughter and then um, having assistant coach roles. I've still had a basketball in my hand. I've still been able to bash girls around you know, yeah. with, a bump, with a bump bag. and So I, I enjoy that side of it. So I still have a ball in my hands, but just not playing myself. So when you came straight out of the sport, what was it that you – did you have an eye on coaching? Because we were talking about you doing commentary now. Yeah. Was there anything you had an, an eye on before that time so you called it? So coaching, No. I, I admire assistant coach. I've been fine. Head coach, stick it up your jumper. <laughs> I yeah. have no interest. Yeah. I, I just... Why was that? Why, why, I why just didn't want to be head coach? I just know it's not 
in my DNA. It's just not, I know my limits yeah. and I'm not meant to be a head coach. And that's why I admire anyone that does it at any level, particularly elite level. I take my hat off to them. Um, but commentating, I was very lucky. I went straight into it with ABC TV and worked with them for 11 years until it was axed. Um, four years ago um, so that was and I was so privileged to go to Beijing and London as the basketball commentator mm. so for me to finish my career in Athens and then go to the next two games I, I wasn't expecting that so that was an absolute bonus yeah mm. I got to go to the London 2012 oh, I got to go see the um, so USA well. men's play it was it was the only yeah. the only tickets I could get for the <laughs> for the whole game it was mm. unreal it was yeah London it, did it extremely well and, I, and when you're media um, at Olympic Games, you're very spoiled because your accreditation has an infinity on it, which means you can get into any event you want. So I was really? like a kid at Christmas. Because oh when you're an athlete, you have to, you can only get into basketball or you put, you sort of have, have a lottery of any ticket that you might get. And then you have to work that around your training and your games. So it didn't matter how far I walked or what time I got to bed or I was, I just loved it. And I love athletics. So I lived at the track and field. So I saw you saying Bolt you know, run the 100-200 in both Beijing and oh, London, which is pretty special. That's incredibly special. And I've got a really great photo up close of his bum. Because, <laughs> 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 you know, his bottom is amazing. It's just <laughs> packed with muscle and he was talking, you know, because our seats were right where they have to snake through and do the media interviews. So, yeah. for me, that was the wow factor photo. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we spoke about you being a mother and and... I just before we start the podcast, I was talking about how being coaching, I find parent parents <laughs> with with uh, with athletes is such an interesting yeah. dynamic. How how we've spoken about how your parents sort of managed you. Mm. How do you, what is your kind of philosophies of parenting with with kids, um, and and sort of do you get involved? Do you sit back? Do you mm. kind of steer the ship a little bit yeah, so what what is it what is it you believe is the best way of managing kids in in yeah. if they've got sporting goals and aspirations as well mm. so it's a balancing act and as i mentioned before um taya it, it was a natural progression for her to start basketball and as i said she she did love it and then she started playing netball and that probably sort of overtook basketball for a love of it um so i was never going to just push her and say you have to do this i want you to play at the elite level that's you know that's what you should be your dream that was never something that i put push the agenda for that and same with my son Cade. he won't play basketball <laughs> at all he just refuses to and i can't force him to play every year when school options came up so you gonna play basketball this year I go no so i wasn't gonna again not gonna force him to um and yeah it's and taya my daughter told me when she was 16 she had potential but she said mum i don't want to play at the elite level and she didn't right. have the desire you don't have the desire there's no point um she's probably got the talent if she really put her mind to it but she doesn't want it how so much of that okay. desire do you reckon i've seen i've seen par parents with the desire i've seen a lot of parents <laughs> yes. that the parents are going I, I wish i could have uh -huh. been a, a professional uh -huh. Um, therefore my time's gone mm. and now I have a child who has has shown promise in it yeah. and I just see so many parents just killing the desire mm -hmm. of their children yes. I've, I've even experienced it with ex-teammates of mine yeah. where their parents drive and push has has only pushed them out the door mm. rather than through it mm. and 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 yeah, it's, I've seen it. it's it's tough isn't it yeah, it's it's just it um because you can't live through your child it's just, it's just never going to work yeah and you can have all the talent in the world if you don't have the desire, it's not going to happen. You know, you can have 10% talent and 90% desire and you're more likely to make it um, if you don't have the desire at all. So, uh, yeah, I, and, and it saddens me when I do see that mm. happening because you're right, they're going to be lost to the sport. They're going to lose the love for that game that potentially could have gone on to be amazing because they're being pushed at home. And you mentioned it, burnout. Burnout mm. is, is like so crucial. K yeah. Kids now that are getting fried mentally yep. before they've even got onto the court the, the field whatever yeah. it is they're going to and trying to to get themselves into I, I i get messages constantly about kids who are looking for for solutions of how to deal with their mental uh, mental health yeah. have you seen an, a, a, how do you how did you deal with your own and how do you kind of like nurture your kids in in looking mm. after their own mental health at the moment um you? it's funny because i actually met with um one of the girls i used to coach she's doing uh sports psychology for her research project at school 
And one of them was, um, have you seen a sports psychologist? And I wish, when I first joined the Australian team, the, a sports psychologist spoke to us, but I can't remember anything that they said. Mm. And then when, did, when we didn't qualify for Barcelona, I wished I'd gone to see a sports psychologist because I was a mess and I didn't really take enough notice of that. Um, but I did see sport co- psychologists over time for different reasons and they're amazing help for me. And it's all about the well-being of the athlete. That's, well, that's the, I think that's, you know, the definition of sports psychology and the mental health but in particular. So, and then another interesting question was, well, should we be introducing 10 to 12-year-olds who are showing that promise at the elite level to sports psychologists? And mm. I was really torn. It's an interesting one, isn't, isn't it? Isn't it? Because it's like, do you mess with something that's not broken? Yeah. Or do you put those measures in place early so they've got techniques to cope if something does go array so it's sort of like that's a, that's a hard one to answer how soon should we be bringing in counseling or help to um, elite athletes? i think personally I, I think there's got to be an element where there, there's a there's a definite moment for for children where i would say pre-teens mm. that they're just soaking up information yeah they kind of don't know the the right from wrong of yeah. what they're doing in their that they're, they're hell of a short or more aware than we used to be. Mm-hmm. I, I used to be, and I'm sure mm. you did, because the access they have to social media and yes. the information that they can get hold of. I've <laughs> been coaching a 13 year old recently who I'm pretty sure he should be up as a stand up comedian. Like the, he, he, whatever he is <laughs> in, in jesting in, mm. on TV, he is just mimicking it. And it, it's incredible. But at the same time, I, I don't feel they have that that moment where they just really know I, I know personally in my career it was probably around 14 15 mm. where I started to register um certain sort of like doubts and self-confidence issues mm. and and then whether it was the ups and downs but up before that you just yeah. you're just taking in information exactly. you're just moving, and do you doing need it. to bring that external person in to complicate things it was yeah i was really torn how to answer that one i was like yeah split between just doing it Mm -hmm. and then analyzing it too much and that's where sport sometimes can get lost yeah where you overanalyze stuff you overcomplicate it you Mm. make it real tough and And that was the interesting one with parenting so after a game you know if taya had had a not a great game i knew that she didn't want to talk about it so i would whereas i know a lot of parents and their children have a heated debate in the car yeah. on the way home because parents want to talk about, you didn't do this well or this well, and that doesn't sit well with me. Because I know as an athlete myself, I wouldn't want to, wanted mum and dad to do that to me. So yeah. it's was like, mm, I'll let her bring it up if she wants to. If not, we'll let it, let I it was, slide. I was the same. I had, mm. a, I had a big, dis, I guess, blow up with my parents when I was growing up because – they weren't sporting so from the outside looking in they were just so interested in what was going on but at the time you just don't want to talk about it you just let me get over this emotional (laughs) like moment that's happened and I will then decompress and I'll come see you later Mm -hmm. but at the time they just want to smother you with love and or or like really (laughs) fire up the conversation and then I just explode and then had to go into almost an agreement with my parents like right we don't talk about sport when 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 Mm. I come back from this game yeah and I even had a kid that I was coaching and it, and it was brilliant. Him and his dad, had, they'd agreed that as soon as we get in the car to go to the game and go to training, we talk about anything other than the sport and mm. their relationship's fantastic. Yeah. And But it, yeah. he has the capacity to go to his dad when he feels mm-hmm. like it and he wants to talk about it. Otherwise, his dad knows not to not to intervene with yeah. his sport. And it's a that's a really good point, I mm. think. that That's something that, especially if someone is a parent, as much as you want to yeah. smother them yeah. from, from it'd be it's so interesting hearing it from your side both having been the athlete and now mm. a mother mm. uh, I've, I'm yet to be a father but I I just know from my side I've never wanted mm. it never never wanted because there were some things I would have loved to have said to her but I knew not to yeah because um, it wasn't the right time and she wasn't going to take it in anyway because you know she's just wanting to it, that you know that's after if it hasn't been a great game or whatever different when it's an awesome game because then they want to talk about it yeah so yeah when it's up it's up yeah it's like, let's talk about it <laughs> yeah. do you think that's helped your relationship with yeah with definitely I, I think so and and it's been interesting with Taya because she doesn't have the same surname as me because she's yep. ranger because I kept spawn and I think that's been a good thing. And she's like a point guard because she just didn't get as tall as I did. I was a post player, so different positions. But there's only been a sort of couple of times where she has said to me that she feels the pressure of being my daughter. So that's, that's been a really oh, delicate 
yeah. um, thing to, I guess, discuss and cope with at times because that makes me feel bad. Yeah, that okay. she had She didn't ask for that. She's just, you know, born into this family. Um, yeah, so th- thankfully it didn't play too big a role. I mean, it's amazing um, that she's even brought it up. I think yeah, even it has even yeah. mentioned it and had mm. the, the know-how to, yeah. to actually bring it up mm. and, and talk to you about mm. it because you were given um, OAM. Is it, <laughs> I'm trying, I was trying to figure out what it is. The, the, so the mm. order, of, order of Australia, order, Medal of Order, order of Australia. Of, yeah, Order of Australia Medal. And that's, I, I can't figure out because in England we have CBE, MBE, uh, OBE. And that's okay. it, but um, yeah, it's an amazing. It is one of the lower ones though because your OA is very big and... Oh no, there's better ones. When did you get it? When did you get it? 2015. Right, mm. okay. So mm. I, I, I was thinking, oh, it must have been Olympics and after mm. doing that, but it mm. came later. Yeah, it came later. Yeah, I think as it should, because you've got to sort of, you know, experience life a bit more and contribute back. Yeah. I don't really think it should just be given to you because you won an Olympic medal. I think it's what you put back in the community that you should be judged on, on more. So how much of your, are you now within, are you doing much within the community of basketball? Um, So we have the uh, Racial Sport Academy. So so this is a pathway to lightning. Um, All of us donate our time. So the girls don't pay to be part of it. I wish we had a big sponsor so we could give them balls, give them shoes. Yeah, I'd love to be able to do that. Why did you set it up? Why did you set well, it up? Well, it was, I was actually um, approached from Chris Lucas, the, the lightning coach, to lend my name to the academy. So it wasn't my idea, it was Chris's idea. And, um, and would I be coach of it? So I said, sure, of course. And so it's been going for, I think, five, coming up to five years. And it, it's wonderful because it's for athletes who are aged between 17 and 20 because once they finish their junior program, there's really not a lot out there for them and for that, that lead into the elite level because it's a big jump, yeah. a massive jump. So, yeah, the trainings um, are all about development and what they probably don't have time to work on at their team training. So we've had a couple of graduates playing the WNBL, which Amazing. is really rewarding. And it's 6 a.m. in the morning <laughs> Wow! <laughs> on, on Wednesday. So we do 10-week blocks. Um, but, yeah, the girls seem to really enjoy it. And we have about 20 athletes at a time. Breaks my heart, though, because we lose so many to college in America. Do you? There's about 430 basketball athletes from Australia currently in America. In America. Mm-hmm. Just for basketball. I'm going to assume it's just naturally because of the draw of getting out, getting out to America is there anything you would try to to stop it or do you do you've been out there yourself so do you partly encourage it do you do you I'd prefer they stay stay here okay I don't I just think in the WNBL we can develop them so well yeah um Sandy Brondello who's the Opals coach she was asked that question recently at lunch she had to be more diplomatic and say look I think they can develop wherever they go yeah but I just think here um you know you stay but it's a life experience. So many girls who do go seem to love it. Some hate it, come home after 12 months. Um, but it's just we're just that age group. We're, we're so sparse mm. between the ages of 18 and 22. And you just hope they do come back to our league. Yeah, I think that's an age gap for most sports that's a real crucial one. Mm. That's 18 for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I see, again, going back to parents who've got young kids and they're like, oh, I want them to be professional. I'm like, honestly, when they hit 18 the doors open to the world yes. and then you find out how much they want it because <laughs> there's so many distractions that uh-huh. can come in. Yep. Uh, and then that little bracket of people who I, I didn't turn professional till I was 20. Mm. So people feel like, oh, if I'm not in the system by 18, I'm, I'm not going to make it. Late. Yeah. Mm. And, and that then is a, a period where your development is huge. Mm. You're starting to really figure out who you are as a person yeah. and, and you're especially technically in your skill set of your whatever sport you're playing. Mm. And your development goes through the roof. And I think there are so many people that will get lost in that 18 to 22 yeah. bracket, not yeah. just in basketball, not just in cricket, in loads of yes. different sports. And that is a, that's a, an area we should be really focusing on. Mm. Is it just technical stuff that you focus on or it just basketball or any stuff that's more of a holistic approach? To uh, well, we've done like a nutrition yeah. um, s- session and um, I did an Asada <laughs> oh, did session you? with them on, on um, obviously drugs and everything because I'm an education presenter yep. with them. Um, so we're sort of trying to tack on just one extra session of, um, and we had a strength and conditioning coach come in just to take them for that, just to change it up as well. 
and just sort of be more aware of their bodies because you know the injuries amongst female athletes at the moment is so prevalent especially particularly ACL injuries really? shocking um AFLW like the Crows have got five at the moment with yeah. little Aaron Phillips is one of those so it's um yeah t- trying to expose them to different things as well like that too mm. yeah so that um how much of the sport that they're playing right now is you really think it's physical that they need to be focusing a little bit more on absolutely and i i think um it's it's learning really about your body your gait and where your weaknesses are and where you need to work on with weights to strengthen yeah. that area of your body i think it's really really important um and I think too with the AFLW, because I would have loved to have played footy when I was young, really? but obviously you couldn't. And there's Erin Phillips had to stop when she was 14 because she wasn't allowed to play because she was a girl. Um, and I just think because girls are coming into AFLW late, they're not sort of growing up like boys are learning how to tackle or fall or that's all, that all will come. But I just think we're going to see a lot of injuries, um, which it is happening um, in the league. But that happens in every sport yeah i think we're just sort of probably focusing on aflw because it's high profile and we hear about it yeah mm. the paces of, of every sport is moving faster oh, yeah. and it is definitely injury rates are yeah. i'm getting it all the time with having giving people things like yoga mm. uh, and whether just the recovery yeah it's so there's so much on trying to play the sport harder faster do more yes. train harder mm. um but actually learning your body, really learning mm. and understanding really your body important. and how you move and, mm. and what's best and what's not so good for you yeah. is so important, yeah. especially in that, that, mm. that age bracket. You mentioned you, you work for ASADA yeah. and uh, that's the uh, Australian Anti-Doping Agency. Yeah, so Australian Sports Anti-Doping Authority. It's funny because I tell people straight away, I don't watch people do a wee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the chaperone. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is... I love this role because I'm an education presenter. I'm back amongst elite sporting environment, which I just keep getting drawn back to. Yeah. And because I've been there, I've been drug tested many times. I've lived and breathed it. So I was only in Melbourne um, last week presenting to all the AFL rookies, so 90 new boys, and then to the AFLW rookies um, in November. Um, so I've gone out to all different sports, and it's really concentrating on you know supplements. Pretty much don't take them. Mm-hmm. Um, illicit drugs you know your medications um, just educating them and trying to you know get them listen and I think what ASADA have done so well because they've recruited 16 athletes all over Australia because when I went through I don't know if you ever had in UK yep um, they would come in it'd be death by PowerPoint you'd be so bored you wouldn't listen whereas now it's more interactive they follow the um, the session on their phones they do polls they do surveys through it, you know video it's it's very good how sada have done it so we're getting really good feedback and then um probably yeah the demand is becoming really high instead of sort of not wanting it now they're wanting it which yeah. is great because one athlete a month australian athletes still testing positive to a supplement and getting banned because they didn't know that there was a banned substance in it so that's the cases of sada hates yeah because they're not trying to do anything wrong and you, you guys are using uh the global Dro correct web, website. Global that's what Dro. we use <laughs> yes. that's what you use the good old global Dro website see, the internet wasn't around when i was playing so initially. was there much so drugs testing when you were when i, you were I doing was it? drug tested 12 times in australia yeah and a couple overseas in the WNBA. so we'd have to ring a hotline we didn't have internet <laughs> and so find out if i can take this yeah yep so that's how it worked yeah and so global Dro is brilliant you just amazing. You, you can just find any product yeah, in there absolutely brilliant. throw it into the website and now and it tells SADA you. have got an app that every athlete should have SADA clean sport app I'm going to promote it so you can look up global draw on that and you can also type in your supplement that you're taking to yeah. see whether it's been batch tested because if a supplement hasn't been batch tested don't take it because there's yeah. no they're not well regulated they can put whatever they want in it and not put it on the label so yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's even at the recreational level where people uh, forget oh, this yeah. it's it is mad mm. when I you're so right we did the powerpoint death by powerpoint and you're sitting there <laughs> asleep and, and all you kind of get into then it comes to like who's been banned for how long and mm. doing what and taking what and you're like someone just took a, a flu medicine done two yeah, years absolutely. banned for life Zudo or banned for two years and then mm. that's it mm. and, and it gets worse harsher then we had mm. a recreational drug testing coming in yeah. so then that that really got there was uh, cricket had had a suddenly a couple of cases of that 
came out and then it started really feeding into other sports but yeah if you can just go to global Dro, type yeah, in what you're what you're doing then fantastic. You find out yeah no it's really good so i'm just loving that role and obviously very passionate about the cause and clean sport pretty much yeah mm. so is there anything in the future you're kind of working towards and you want to that you want to achieve or or yeah, it's, get into um, the world of sport. It's been an interesting ride when you retire um, because so many athletes do struggle with with it with the transition, and for me, being a mum helped uh, certainly with that. And then I was CEO of the Australian Melanoma Research Foundation for six years, which was so rewarding. But I got a bit burnt out with that because not for profit is a um, mm -hmm. difficult space. So I was so I resigned from that position eighteen months ago. And I was a little bit lost for 12 months. I was mm. like, I don't know what I want to do. Because basketball was my, my favourite thing in the world and it was my, my career. I classed that as my career, even though I didn't make a lot of money from it. So it's, it's really hard finding what, something that you love. So for me, the role with Asada is sort of my long-term, um, I guess, goal is to keep doing this role um, you know, maybe move in a different area, but just sink my teeth into mm. this role at the moment. Um, yeah, and, and still be, stay involved with basketball because it's going to, you know, it's in my blood. Yeah. I'm, gonna be, I'm still commentating, still coaching, um, and just love that sort of area of, of, of I guess, of basketball because um, I'm not a player anymore. How to stay involved, really. Mm. Mm. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been <laughs> amazing. Um, but I've, I've, I found this conversation fascinating, just some of the, the stuff around parenting as well. I think it's, <laughs> it's so, so important yeah. for, for kids. But um, Rachel, thank you thank so you much. Thank you, Lewis. Cheers. Pleasure.